Greetings from the University of Notre Dame Press. My name is Christopher Rio Suvergrubi, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Press. We are excited to be here today under the auspices of our Books for Better Understanding author event series. Today's featured author is David Bentley Hart, whose upcoming book, You Are Gods on Nature and Supernature, will be published by Notre Dame Press in April 2022. John Milbank joins us from the United Kingdom to lead our discussion. I'd like to start by introducing our esteemed guests. David Bentley Hart is one of America's leading Eastern Orthodox theologians and scholars of religion, and is a philosopher, writer, and cultural commentator. He is the author and translator of 24 books, including Theological Territories, a David Bentley Hart Digest, which was published by the University of Notre Dame Press in 2020, and is the recipient of the 2020 Publishers Weekly Best Book in Religion Award and the 2020 Forward Reviews Indies Book of the Year Award in Religion. John Milbank is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Nottingham and remains one of today's leading Anglican theologians. He is the author of over 13 books and numerous articles, in addition to being a key contributor to Adam's Curse, Reflections on Religion and Literature, published by Notre Dame Press in 2001, and the Press's upcoming book, Toward a Sacramental Poetics, which will be published in December of this year. Thank you both for being here today. I will start with the first question. Dr. Hart, in the first chapter, Waking the Gods, you submit that the only phenomenologically and theologically coherent position in the nature-supernature debate is to affirm that our supernatural end is a natural possibility. As you put it, quote, there is only grace all the way down and nature all the way up, end quote. This is in response to a certain resurgence today of so-called two-tier Thomism, which you argue is conceptually incoherent. Can you reflect aloud on why you think this resurgence has taken place and why a response thereto is needful today for the Christian and for the general reader of theology, outside of the obvious necessity of correcting bad thinking? In other words, what are the practical or lived implications for your reader of correcting two-tier Thomism as you do? Well, actually, the first, the first part of that question is one that, for, for which I have a rather inadequate answer. I mean, I don't understand the resurgence of this, this view of grace and nature or grace and supernature nearly as well as I wish I did, because I tend to ascribe it to pathologies rather than to uh, uh, you know, the logical exigencies of the moment. I mean, John may have better insight into this than I do. I do know that uh, it does answer a certain appetite for uh, you know well-defined boundaries that are non-porous and exclusive. I mean, the, uh, the the hard and fast distinction between nature and supernature is also a distinction between those truths which are salvific and those which are not, and and tends to confine the former in a very uh, an almost positivistic sense in uh, in a series in, in in a set of divinely revealed and yet not rationally deducible truths that are the exclusive possession of a tradition. And if you're a traditionalist, very worried about the uh, I don't know the lyseity with which uh, Christian culture seems to be. Uh, flirting with all sorts of other possibilities of, of, of the narrow, of the narrow gate to salvation. You know, what, what, what that means. I, I can see psychologically why you might want to embrace this as a way of, of reasserting cultural and religious demarcations, because what it tells us is that the entirety of nature, the entirety of natural experience, the entirety of art and nature and culture and, and sociality, all of that is in a sense extrinsic to the saving mystery that comes in the form of a certain set of information that can be provided by, by uh, Catholic tradition alone. Um, I don't know, that may be unfair. I don't, I'd ask John how he sees it. But, but, but my first response is that there's some kind of psychological need for the, for, 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 uh, the question to reassert itself, for this way of seeing things to reassert itself. And any lived implications for um, why you think it would be important to correct this yeah. pathology, um, as it were? Well, I, I, you know, my experience of it is, is that it does uh, breed a kind of, the, of um, moral obtuseness. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is a 
as a blanket condemnation. There are many who are in this school, that's simply what they've been told, that grace is extrinsic to the nature of the creature. But it carries with it the implication, the, 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 the circle of the saved, the circle of, the, of those who receive grace is ex- extremely small, that we should be comfortable with this, that in fact, this is part of the good news. I mean, I, I think there is a kind of, uh, it, it has a kind of uh, morally atrophying effect on the imagination and on and and in fact on on the motives of the heart, and I've seen it. I mean, I, this this is actually why I wrote the book to begin with, or rather, grim experiences I had uh, at various places. I taught as a visiting professor where where this style of uh, second scholastic Thomism was resurgent again, and I saw that it that it appealed specifically to a desire to affirm the meagerness of grace, in a sense, and in fact, in a sense, to rejoice in that and to find reasons for being comfortable with that, say that, you know, I, I remember speaking recently, this came to me secondhand, but from a, a Cistercian, not a Dominican, but a Cistercian in this tradition, who was arguing that so great is the elevation from nature to supernature and so unmerited by the creature that if God were to save but one soul and condemn all the rest to hell, it would still be a cause of rejoicing. I mean, at that point, you, you've arrived at uh, you know, consummate absurdity. I mean, at that point, you know, there's no point speaking of the gospel as good news. Obviously, it's rather bad news for the cosmos at large, if it may be good news for Henry, the one guy who enjoys the super elevation. I, uh, but uh, I do think, uh, yeah, I do think it it um, it creates a kind of hardness of heart and a kind of spiritual narrow uh, narrow vision that's that's hideously damaging and also drives saner souls away from Christianity. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Milbank, the floor is yours. Yes. Well, I, I, I very much agree with all that David has said, and I think I share his bewilderment. I mean, why are all the good arguments and all the solid historical scholarship being rejected? And I tend to agree with him that while, you know, the people um, who've returned to neo-scholasticism are, are perfectly sincere, I do think that to explain why that's happened, um, we have to look at sociological, psychological, and even pathological explanations. I mean, I think part of the answer is a, a sense of panic, a sense that things have got too complicated, and that we somehow there's a past that we need to go back to that was simpler, um, and 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 it's easier. You know, you just have to read Thomas Aquinas in the way you're told to read it. Thomas Aquinas, it saves you. Um, an awful lot of hard work. And I think it's a sincere but uh, completely false diagnosis of of the surrender to to liberalism. In fact, I think the people um, who were trying to overcome Pura Natura had had a sophisticated critique of modernity and, and of liberalism. And I think Therefore, the, the other reason why people are returning to, to pure nature is a kind of actually sinister double thing that, that it allows um, Catholics to, to speak in the purely public sphere um, without making any, apparently any specifically Catholic claims uh, and to insist on conclusions that actually they're only coming to because they're Catholic. But, but to pass them off as natural conclusions. So that it's ultimately a, a power move because it's saying we want to appropriate uh, in the name of the church an essentially liberal, technocratic, individualist, non-teleological modernity because it's completely clear that if you, if you assert pure nature, you lose pure you lose teleology this is this is why i'm puzzled that somebody like mcintyre can't see that it's it's clear that suarez completely loses teleology yeah. and goes over to something more like a kind of neo-stoic kind of view view of morality so it, it it's not an accident that this leads to 
um, so-called integralism, or, or if you like, a very bad form of integralism that's all too akin to the moves made by somebody like 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 Mora. You know that your your the church um, then is is the the arbitrary um, power in charge of an essentially secular sphere with privileges um, reserved for this elite group. In other words, you know, let's make no bones about this. Um, the return to pure nature is incipiently fascistic. Uh, let me just make that. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and has revealed itself as such. I mean, I, I don't know if uh, those watching this review have encountered the Crayon and Fimister volume integralism, but I mean, it's a perfect yes. example of, in a sense, a perfectly consistent uh, with a few with a few uh, yep. dissonant American inflections about the free market and things like that, which are just, you know, neoliberalism mm -hmm. at its at its is arbitrarily yep. most acute expression. But uh, it, it shows yep. you that ultimately this becomes it has to be. I mean, ultimately, the, the sphere of nature has to be confined within the limits of which it's capable would have to be governed from above by the cognoscenti who have access Exactly. To a saving knowledge that either uh, w will or will not be uh, embraced by the subjects of the regime, but nonetheless. And by the way, John, I mean, I, I would also add that that, it'll, that in some cases, at least we see this in the uh, American Catholic circles, it allows Catholics, uh, certain Catholic public figures to argue for ends that don't come from their Catholicism, but to which they, they, they've decided... No. Completely. There's a kind of yeah. There's a kind of indifference yeah. on the part of grace, that the that nature has its own uh, uh, intrinsic logic that, though uh, obedient to natural law, nonetheless has yep. exigencies yeah. and limits that that it'll allow for prudential uses of non-Christian, you know, non-Christian measures to to bring about the peace. Mm, that was great. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a curious thing, too, because uh, it is a retreat not really to an older Catholic tradition of, of any great antiquity. I mean, there's something we should point out here is this is a already a 16th century aberration that we're talking about. One that, that uh, the reason it uh, uh, is so comfortable with a kind of state absolutism in, in things like the integralism volume is it's all is this very uh, this very partition between nature and supernature in this absolute sense is already the carving out of the of of of, of a secular sphere complete in itself. Yes, of course. And yes. uh, you know it's totally at, at odds with the language of scripture, with the language of patristic tradition, with most of medieval tradition. I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of it actually organically coming from Thomas, except you know unless you pluck certain uh, certain phrases. It's completely kind of against it. the main thrust of Aquinas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and of course every really impressive Catholic theological and scholarly mind. Of the modern period rejects it out of hand is clearly an aberration, and yet it seems to be the safe the safe harbor for a certain sort of uh, troubled soul that's fleeing a modernity right. that, with which it's actually quite complicit. Um, yes. Yeah. So, okay, what do you want us to do that? next, Christopher? <laughs> well, if you'd like to ask another question, you're more than welcome to. Um, yes, I've got, I've got a few questions. I mean, D David has written a, a magnificent book, some of which I've seen before. Uh, the last chapter I hadn't seen, and it's the last chapter I like both. And for me, um, just speaking personally, I felt it crossed the T's and dotted the I's on the direction that my, my own thinking has been going um, for, for, for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I, I, I might express this, uh, you know, you know, convergence. But um, I think um, what David is is doing is arguing that the, the um, certain figures that you might see as the radicals, slightly seen on the margins, if we're talking about Maximus, Arugana, 
uh, the school of Chartres, uh, Eckhart, Nicholas of Cusa, and I would add to that many 17th century French oratorians, um, Beroul, even Malebranche, that, that, that actually these people are the most orthodox in, in a certain sense, because they're following through on the implications of, of, of orthodoxy, particularly uh, insisting on the divine unity, simplicity, on, on the ultimately the perspective of eternity as being what one has to ascend towards. Um, and, and if one believes in divine simplicity and unity and creation out of nothing, you, you cannot simply see the creation as a kind of arbitrary production of God, standing alongside God, simply in the way that, you know, that teacup over there on my desk is, is alongside the plex. And that, that there's too much, um, even in the, the most respectable thinkers, that, that something sometimes sounds like that, including the idea that God is sort of looking at a repertoire of choices uh, before him, a kind of menu and selecting from those menus. Yeah, they, yeah. This is an absurdly idolatrous view of God, and it doesn't really concur with what the Bible is talking about, the fathers are talking about, um, Augustine and Aquinas at their best are talking about. And I think another way of putting what David is saying is that he's insisting that Christianity is not qualifying monotheism. Christianity is monotheism. And it's it's not even qualifying perennial monism, if 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 you like, if you if you put it in a in a deeper way. And I think David and I would agree that um in fact Neoplatonism and Vedanta and Islamic mysticism are more monistic than, say, Spinoza, because immanentism collapses into a kind of dualism. Um yeah. Uh, 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 the perspective of the whole versus the perspective of of, of the parts, you know. Um, and for all that, I rather like Spinoza. I think that's the problem. So yeah. I think his insistence that actually, um, you know, um, an emanationism, um, monotheism, these are actually the more monistic visions. And that if, if we've got all these things in Christianity, like Trinity, Incarnation, um, grace and deification and so on. These aren't qualifying monism. They are spelling monotheism out. They're spelling it out. They're spelling out the logic, the grammar, the coherence of monotheism. And that has um, an implication which I think David spells out extremely well in this book, that, that there's no longer a, any conflict between hospitality towards other religions um, and an insistence on Christian uniqueness. And it's it's not an accident that somebody whose metaphysics was so Christological, like Nicholas of Cusa, was also the first person to say, well, hold on, you know, Islam's not all bad, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and 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 why why should that be the case? Well, I think um it, it, exactly because you're saying, look, we 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 agree with this rigorous monism, monotheism, we agree. And even with rigorous monism, it's just that we actually think our doctrines are, are realizing this even more. And of course, the complexity there is that you are referring to um, a historical events. But, and, and that means the peculiarity is if you like, you're having to integrate history of metaphysics. And, and this is why, I think, again, you know, David is right to say, look, Hegel was trying to do the th right thing. He, he did it in the wrong way in the end, you know, because of this sort of agonism in God that's probably ultimately to, to do with Luther, Luther via Berber. And yet, in the end, he's kind of doing the right thing. So I suppose, oh, all right, let's, let's, let's get to a question. You know, John. Let's get to a question. <laughs> you, you, more or less... <laughs> Couldn't want well. I, I'm advertising your book. You know, yeah, no, you're doing it brilliantly. It's just, just you're not leaving me a lot to say. <laughs> Go on. But okay, to 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 get to a question in a rather random order, I suppose you could also say that Hegel is is trying to bring together um, something one could see as 
you know, a perennial monistic vision with a, a legacy that's particularly Western. So my, yeah. my question is roughly along these lines, that while I, I, I agree with you that, that we've got to now look at people like Arugana, we've got to put Arugana at the center, not Aquinas. It remains the case that I still think Augustine and Aquinas are peculiarly great theologians. Why? Um, because they pay such attention to time, to psychology, to experience, to politics, to history, and, oh. and, to, and to ethics. So is it, is it possible to say um, that the positive thing in the Latin legacy is this sort of attention to the person and to the drama, if, if you like, but that the task now might be to try and sort of reconcile that greater personalism of the West with uh, a valid metaphysical monism that, that, that's more, more, more Eastern. That, that, that's the question. Well, I, I think that, uh, of course, <clears throat> Bulgakov already went some yeah, there was already considerable during... way in that direction because, oh, because he yes. takes a, yeah. a, a very, and, and, and throughout his work, an increasingly rich understanding of what constitutes persons as persons, uh, both in the, you know, the hidden depths of, and, uh, of the unexpressed and the unexpressed and understands this in, as he goes along as the very structure of being itself. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm perfectly in agreement with that. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, what I say actually in the book is not, <laughs> not to reject Obviously, Augustus and Aquinas, but a certain displacement of the emphasis on scholasticism, say, uh, that would make more room for uh, this, uh, the, what's understood as the minority report, but that actually clarify. I mean, I, I understand uh, Arugana as, uh, in many ways, adv making advances, not just on the Eastern tradition with which he was familiar. But on Augustine as well. No, I agree. Yeah. You know, he is his. Um, of course, early he first enters theological history uh, with the con with the uh, controversies that Gottschalk uh, roused over uh, double predestination, and the and and this obliged him to master the Augustinian corpus to use Augustine against Gottschalk's Augustine. But but I mean I think if you look at at uh, at at the, at the Perry you 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 you, you uh, see that he's every bit as much an Augustinian uh, as he is, uh, when it comes to his understanding oh, yeah. of, the, of the divine yeah. nature, how he understands yeah. divine simplicity, how he understands God's expression of uh, uh, of the paternal depth in in filial manifestation and and so to speak the circuit of divine rejoicing which is the spirit and how that encompasses creation in its logic aquinas too i will point this out though i mean there are there are uh, when you mentioned earlier this this sort of uh, image of god as de deciding between uh, different possibilities and a kind of landscape of possibilities as though he's a, a an extrinsic agent faced with, uh, you know, a decision regarding which car to buy the creation. The, there, is, the, there are, this is one of the places where, where Thomas goes back and forth because, you know, he, first of all, because of his, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, is his infralapsarian understanding of the incarnation immediately separates the rationale of creation from Christology, at least, um, uh, logically speaking, if not in actual fact. And then even the issue of whether or not the world that is the world of Jesus of Nazareth is the best of all of all worlds he could have created, he, he does say that, well, there's no such thing because there are an infinite number of worlds uh, between that world and this that, that modally uh, still are infinitely short of, of the glory of God. And so, I mean, there, there is there a hint already of this problem of how to understand creation as, as, as a decision of the will. But, 
uh, it's 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 a, a sort of fleeting moment in Thomas. It's one of the moments that he hasn't thought out particularly well. I, I don't want to blame him if I, in the second, but but it becomes um, it, it becomes determinative in this later manualist tradition to a very great degree because once again, um, the, the very nature of creation being infinitely remote from the order of grace already is, in a sense, a kind of arbitrary construct of the divine will to which, superadded, uh, there, there, there can be a, a, a gracious sequela if God chooses, but he needn't choose, you know. So it, it's not entirely absent from Aquinas. But no, no, I agree with everything you just said. In fact, uh, <laughs> you more or less uh, answered the question you asked me before you asked me the question. So I'm, I'm a little at a loss here to think of how to, how to uh, uh, amplify on it. Uh, but I, as I say, I think Bulgakov uh, actually laid out the program better than any other modern theology and understanding. Uh, well, f- first of all, because he took the time to understand the, the tradition, e- even when he got it wrong, if he had a, you know, a, a vast grasp of, of uh, the antecedent history of Western Christian thought before the German idealists. He understood where the German idealists went astray. I mean, that's, of course, it begins, as all Russians of that period did, in a dialogue with Hegel and Schelling, when the late Schelling. Yeah. Yeah. And I think his his union of, of a kind of Augustinian personalism and the Maximian metaphysics is one of the brilliant theological syntheses of the 20th century, and one that's Absolutely. only now, I think, yes. becoming no, no. more and more. No, 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 no. It's terribly encouraging. Yeah. Uh, and, and you see more and more uh, as, yeah. as translations of Bulgakov are appearing. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. Right. Can, can, I, can I sort of um, follow that up with a related question? Um, as I was saying, I, I, I feel incredibly close to what, what, what you're writing. I agree with everything. I, I guess that um, if, if I was doing a similar sort of thing, possibly the words impossibility and paradox would 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 feature more. And I sometimes notice you edging away from paradox, which is interesting because it's such a favorite term for de Lubac. So just to try to flesh that out a little bit, um, you know, it, it, throughout your book, you, you, you've got this idea of a point of indifference or indeterminacy between coming out and going back between, um, you know, creation and salvation and ultimately between God and creation. And and I I think this is correct. But, and again, it's like a Rugana, you, you have to say that God is, is somehow more than God, that, 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 you know, uncreated God is also created God, but don't we, because if if we're saying there's something more than God, even though there can't be something more than God, and if we're refusing any kind of university of being or something like that, we're refusing the idea that there's a bigger framework of being, then aren't we forced to see that um, very much as paradox? Um, and I, I think slightly similar considerations apply without spelling them out. To, to to Christology, um, where there's a, a coincident, even though finite and infinite aren't in competition, to say that they're perfectly coming together is somehow a mystery. But then just to illustrate the use of the word impossibility, um, the, the only point where I, I, I slightly hesitated in the book was when you were saying, well, look, there's evil there because we're on the journey from nothingness to God. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you, you know, so um, sort of, as it were, nothingness is an alibi, because, you know, if everything, if God is drawing us forth and there's nothing sinister about this nothingness, uh, uh, there's no pagan sinisterness left about the nothing. Don't we still have to say that, you know, the fall remains absolutely incomprehensible and 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 in a way we only have a kind of ethical access to that and again i think that's where there's a diff there may be a difference between i, mean, I don't think the difference though is as great as you yeah. think if you look at what i say about that yeah. what i mean is simply that 
um, the possibility. All I'm saying there is the possibility of of evil is not the 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 divine a need. <laughs> like, you know, this is the problem. Is is quite often these things are well, Why did why, why did God ordain an order in which uh, evil was a possibility? What was the purpose thereof? And my, my claim is that uh, whatever that that possibility is, it's not. It's 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 not uh, ordinated, you know, in the in the in the th- theological sense. It's not ordained uh, by God towards a specific end in which evil plays a constitutive part. It's simply that no. that if the possibility no, opens up, there it, it, it opens up within that that vocation, yeah. but, out of genuine nothingness. But but you're right. I mean, it, it doesn't. It it still doesn't explain uh, because I'm quite yeah. clear. I mean, I, I take the high intellectualist understanding of rational freedom is that even in that infantine state, uh, children are better than we are, after all, for the very simple reason that they they genuinely, until a certain until a certain uh, yeah. degree of sophistication sets in, are like God, incapable of evil. God is the you know sort of the yeah. eternal child. But, uh, I think I think. What, what 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 I'm sort of driving at is that given the sort of metaphysical incomprehensibility of evil, the fact that it's just sheer nonsense, there is a sense in which our our um, under access to it is existential and dramatic. And perhaps at that point, is it possible to say that the Vedanta doesn't quite have the Platonic sense of the good and the the linking of the good to our behavior in the city it, it, uh, and so forth. Isn't that yeah, it, it, something it, it, different here? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously there are differences, although even there you have to yeah. qualify that regarding whether you're talking about certain schools of Advaita Vedanta. No, I know. Yeah. Advaita, yeah. Vishish, I, and forget about Vaita, but the, uh, the Vishishta Advaita tradition also has political theory and, and cultural theory at, at the margins that actually makes room for understanding the good as a, as a pragmatic and practical and social thing as well. But you're right. I mean, this this is one of the deficiencies of, of the Vedantic tradition that I think can be, you know, you, you do have to turn back to the Christian Platonist tradition. And, and then, again, as Augustine lays out, you know, there is nothing like the city of God before the city of God, it's 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 sort of a thunderbolt, and that it understands that 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 the eternal and the historical uh, 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 coincidence in Christ has has ramifications that a an older and more antique Platonic metaphysics hadn't yet you know discovered for obvious reasons. But but let me get back to the thing about nothing. I mean the point the point is the question is the way it's often posed is why didn't God simply create you know beings already beyond the capacity for evil? And I mean my, my only claim there that I'm making is that a creature is a creature only if it has the history of a creature. It actually has to have a, an absolute uh, uh, past in non-being. It, it can't be a fiction, uh, not a, uh, not simply a dramatist persona who has been crafted with a fictional past, and that whatever the mystery of evil is of sin, it happens in that always pastness of whatever it is that makes us who we are. It's why it's understood in Christian thought as, mm-hmm. as an inheritance, even though it's also something that I think Bulgakov is right about. You have to understand it's having all, happening on the threshold between the ionic and the, and the chronic or between. Um, so, so I was not, I, I'm not trying to uh, put the blame on nothingness as this, this is just a sort of constitutive deficiency and that evil is explicable in those rational terms. I don't we'll know, blame I think, Mame instead, put the blame right. on Mame. I mean, I mean, to me, uh, evil, yeah, like yeah. the designated hitter rule, is just is just a mystery yeah. of that 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 no one can penetrate how how this could have happened. Uh, as for paradox, again, it depends on how the you know. I my offer of paradox as long as one remembers that the proper meaning of paradox is that the contradiction is at one level at the apparent level, but what it reveals is a, an unexpected and deeper unity. Again, one of the things I love yeah, about yeah, yeah. Olgakov's Christology yeah. is he took the Neo-Chalcedonian, what would almost look like uh, uh, you know, a paradoxical use of hypostasis as uniting natures that otherwise um, would almost be antithetical to one another, which creates to be a, a kind of, a kind of 
uh, Christ chimera, you know, in which, and he understood, and, and he used the, the image of Sophia in the Sophianic language to see how, in fact, what this affirms is the rootedness of both divine and human nature in the, in the, in the divine depth, you know, the divine paternal depth of what he calls hypostasability. But I mean, that, 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 again, that, that, uh, inf infinite, um, intention towards full personal express full, full person you know the, again it's it's a deeply it's a way of grounding the metaphysics in a kind of personalism uh i i don't use the word paradox as much as you do in fact i, I tend to think you use it a little obsessively if you don't mind my saying so but um uh but again it, it's just that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see being misunderstood on the one hand you're right it, you can impoverish the language of christianity if you don't insist upon the sheer surprise of these, uh, of, yeah. of Christology. But I still think that, uh, to use one of your terms, that what we're pushing towards is a Christological monism, which reveals that the, the paradox actually is the revelation of a deeper uh, rationality that can be unfolded uh, through a proper Trinitarian metaphysic. You need, you need the Holy Spirit there to do this, but, uh, you know. But I, I don't think those are great differences between us. I no, think I, I, I it's just didn't a matter think, of idiom. Didn't think they were that, that they were, and I should probably unpack paradox um, uh, um, uh, a, a well, bit you more. Don't, you don't want to be mistaken yeah. for just one of those yeah. people who, in the train of Kierkegaard, stop with the paradox and then demand a kind of, if not fideistic, at least no. Uh, you know, uh, at least theatrically. Uh, no, no, but, uh, uh, and I think I think that probably misreads Kierkegaard anyway. Oh no, I, but, it does. But, I, I mean, I think it. I, mean, yeah. I think I think when you get to the late writings and the practice in Christianity, in love, um, you realize that, that that itself, as is infuriatingly the case with Kierkegaard, is a stage in yeah. a progressive argument. But you do encounter uh, what you encounter you first know, is paradox. Yeah. I think that the point is more that if this, you know, if you, if you like this point of indifference, if it, if it isn't simply a kind of univocal sort of monism, then right. inevitably it's incredibly enigmatic uh, right. and it leaves us in a kind of to and fro and so on. But if, if I could just... Um, well, can I just interject there yeah. really quickly? I mean, remember, I mean, th that point of indifference is very much pneumatological. I mean, it's it's uh, in, in in not only in my essay, but I mean, uh, something I want to point out is uh, in Paul. You know, uh, translations for so long have obscured this, but but in Paul, there is uh, a rhetorical and then logical sort of indifference at times between divine and human spirit. I, I, I completely agree with all you say about the spirit. It, it's, yeah. it's fun. And actually that leads well into the next question because um, this has to do with the model, you know, the circle of glory that your book is very much um, about a circle. It, it, it's about an outgoing and a return and they're the same things. And your model of the Trinity is is often very much to do with um, return. I, I mean, there is there is being a manifestation, and um, then there is a rejoicing that sort of takes you back to the beginning. Oh, and incidentally, can I? I don't want to fail to say this. I thought that the way you connect the theology to the chiasmic co-belonging of being and intelligence is fantastic. It, it, it's that's just wonderful and and that's a new move that i think is really really important but that keeps me on the track of the circle so so that you you insist very strongly that you know the beginning and the end are identical and of course that's um completely correct um it it, it can lead us uh you know with the kind of question that oregon asks about well um could there be repeated falls? And, and I guess that the answer to that, as it is in Oregon, is, is Christological, that, that you, um, you discover if you're fallen that actually you can't fall because God has brought you back again. Um, and I, but, I believe but, there's only one circle of eternity. I don't believe there are successes. Yes, no, 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 I, I, I get that, but I think yeah. it's for 
I think it's for Christology, it's because God has gone yeah. right down to the bottom. Um, but but that does raise, I think, the question and, and, about and the relationship. And, and then brought back in the yes. spirit. To the, but yeah. there is a certain question about, about the relationship of the, the, the circle to the straight line. So that what, what, I mean, quite rightly, you say that Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine have actually quite similar models of the Trinity and quite similar understandings of the spirit as a kind of bond. But I... There, there is, as you know, there is another model of the Trinity that we find in Dionysus, that we find in Victorinus, that we find in Maximus, and we find in Arugana, which uh, is deriving from Porphyry and is this sort of esse vivere intelligere, sometimes expressed as essence, potency, and operation model, where, which you might say, you know, to put it really crudely, it, it, where, where the other one is circular, this is kind of developmental. So that I, my, my question is along the lines of, is, is there any sense at all in which there is also linearity in God, um, a, a sort of progress in God in, in, in which you're, there's the moment of being, the moment of manifestation, but then the intellectual moment is, is in a way, the, 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 the spiritual moment is, is in a way um, the third moment. Yeah. And, and, and whether then we can sort of, um, well, that, that's why, we, I, why, why I, I think mean, Hegel's yes, question is, yes. Is, is, is an inevitable. I mean, if, 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 you like, yeah. if you like, it's almost saying there's a kind of epictasis in, in God. Um, yeah. And whether one can relate that to the idea that evil is, is a kind of impatience, it's a failure to get to the end, yet it's a failure to arrive at the spirit, it's a failure to arrive at the, in the, the incarnation, it's a failure to have the you know the complete trinity if you like so my question is just whether whether one could do more with that other model or of, of, of the trinity and how one would integrate it with the more circular model yeah no i mean i i think that um obviously the two models aren't exclusive and w w w the easy thing to do is simply to try to divide them between the eternal and the temporal, you know. <laughs> the, yeah, but, and and uh, this is an advanced course, you know. <laughs> right. All right. Yes. Yeah. But I mean also I think that that, that that if you if you allow that to become a discontinuity, then then in a sense the course of history yeah. both expresses and dissembles, but doesn't participate and also doesn't participate in the divine mystery. So I think that yeah, I I, I like it and and uh, you know um, uh, others have said it before that the, the that the spirit also represents a kind of futurity. So the, I mean, you know, you get this in the Cappadocians occasionally, uh, while denying all temporality of God, speaking of the Father uh, in one sense as that absolute past that is always becoming uh, manifest and moving towards the absolute future of spirit. In time, this is manifested. Of course, the age of spirit is coming. The the Alam Haba is the, is the spiritualization of creation. I mean, it, it, the absolute revelation of of the Holy Spirit, the fabric of nature, and that 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 um, you know, it, it, it's there's no reason not to. It's, there's nothing not to say map this onto the story uh, into the history of Revelation as well as Gregory of Nazianzus did. Which again, as I say, is why uh, the sort of questions that Hegel raises are are implicit already. Uh, and, uh, is, the the, the interesting thing about the you know the being life intelligence model is that it exists in the, in the east and in the west. Right. It's in the, and and therefore it is a point of mediation and and perhaps a point where we see how we can sort of integrate more evolutionary and historical. Right thought into this yeah. monistic picture. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, which again, uh, uh, Arugana uh, is, is, is tremendously helpful with as well, because he, I think you, see, you asked that question, but I mean, I think Arugana already has, has sort of, to some degree, demonstrated uh, um, how these two models of the Trinity uh, yes. are, not, are not in competition yeah. with one another and how, the, how, how both uh, take in the mystery of creation uh, and, uh, and uh, as a Trinitarian mystery of divine self-manifestation. Yeah. 
both re uh, return and, so to speak, I don't know, full development. You know, you have to be careful of the language you use because someone will accuse you of being a process theologian if you dare to use the wrong word here. But you know what I mean is that the Father really unfolds fully in the Son and and uh, reaches complete, uh, you know, the, the complete form of divine knowledge and joy in the Spirit. Yeah, that, that is a procession. That is both a, a, a gener God generating God and God proceeding from that generation as God, you know, to, to, to the fullness of God, you know. So, um, thank you very yeah. much. Un unfortunately, we are, are we coming to the end already. We are at the end of our time. Oh, However, one more question. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're at the end. However, I, I, I wanted uh, to, okay. I, I would like to give David um, the final word if he could finish responding to your previous question and also perhaps um, tie it in more uh, explicitly to the super, uh, nature supernature debate for our viewers. The nature supernature debate. I mean, I, I, I honestly, um, I mean, it's a very complex thing now that you've asked. But, but, but l l l l l to return to that issue, five minutes. You, why don't you take five minutes, and we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Well, that may be too much time because that will tempt me to say even more. Is I was trying to come up with a we very do, simple I formulation. Do, go do what you want. I, I wanted to be just, I, I wanted to leave you with something enigmatic and aphoristic. <laughs> <laughs> then you say, with five minutes, uh, you, you can conquer the world if you use those five minutes. Bro. All right. Um, no, I, let's say this. I mean, it, it, the... the um, Understand that the that the revived uh, second scholastic Thomism is one that, in a sense, entirely cuts off nature and history and culture from the Trinitarian mystery. The Trinity becomes information that the Church possesses, as does the beatific vision. Neither of which have to enter into our understanding of history or nature or evolution, right? That, 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 that in a sense, the entirety of Christian revelation as a saving mystery has become an, an extrinsic fact about a world that exists in itself without manifesting the divine, except insofar as it is vaguely oriented towards transcendental goods, hmm. right? I don't think that's what, what, the Christian story is. I don't think that makes sense of God becoming a man that man and that humanity might become God and that 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 the you know tikkun olam, the apocatastasis tan panto, the, res the restoration of all things would be the real revelation of the God who is all in all. I, it's such a truncation, such an abridgment of what is what is proclaimed from the New Testament onward that I think that it's it's fundamentally a nihilistic parody of Christianity. Uh, so that's how I would tie it in. I think what John and I have been discussing here, I mean, I, I, as exotic as it may sound, I think is simply good New Testament. Yes. I seen Chalcedonian uh, reflection. And, and I, I even say that in an exclusive way, because the non-Chalcedonian churches actually have as rich a Christology. It's just a different language. I just mean that this is orthodoxy. And the richness of it uh, that, that takes in the entire experience of nature and of human community, of human culture, and of the history of evolution is something that, that these, you know, grace infuses all of this. And it's already fundamentally redemptive. Creation and salvation are not separate moments. They are the calling of all things out of nothingness into union with the God who, in a sense, you know, uh, not just expresses himself, but is the God he is in being God in, in the created as well. Um, and, and I think that uh, that's not only where you know, the, the future of healthy Christian Orthodox reflection leads, but they, you have to prevent. Can I say something very quickly? Then? At all costs. Wait, let me just finish the sentence. <laughs> prevent okay. at all costs this alternative picture, which is so hideously destructive of that beautiful narrative. Do, what, what you're saying, though, does surely involve, and I think this is implicit in what you're saying, that there's value in the finite and the scarce, as well as in the infinite and the plenitude. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, Ultimate value, in a sense. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that the, the, the actually the, the history, the story, the labor of being created and being saved, which is one of the same, includes Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> Michelangelo's David, yes. and all the butterflies that you've ever appreciated. I mean, yes. this, you know, yes. and, and not to see that, not to understand that is a form of yeah. consummate philosophical and theological philistinism. Blasphemy as well. Yeah. Blasphemy, yeah. Uh, yeah. against the goodness yeah. of creation and, exactly. and, and, and the infinite modalities of God's beauty. Mm -hmm. On that note, I want to thank you both, David Bentley Hart and John Milbank, for being here today, for speaking thank with you. us. It it's has a been pleasure, an absolute, Christopher. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute delight listening to your conversation you. about David's upcoming book, um, You Are Gods on Nature and Supernature. The book is available for pre-order and will be available in print in April 2022, wherever books are sold. We encourage you to visit and support your local independent bookstores, either in person or online, or you can order the book through the Notre Dame Press website at undpress.nd.edu. Thank you.